First of all, thank you very much for coming. I'm going to describe a situation which you may find has similarities with your situation in your country, and you may find has great differences. But I hope you'll be able to get something out of my presentation and uh, possibly think about your situations in the light of what's, of what's happened in Spain. I, I thought I'd begin um, by talking a little bit about the context. I think in several of the presentations I've seen so far since I've been here, um, the importance of context has come up over and over again. The importance of where the teaching is going on, where the training is going on, um, exactly who the students are, exactly who the trainees are. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the country that I work in, which is Spain. Here it is. Spain is a very large country in geographical terms, um, but it's quite small in terms of population. There are about 45 million uh, inhabitants in Spain. And um, the British Council works in different areas in Spain. Um, I'll just go back to this one. It work the British Council works in uh, Barcelona, here in Catalonia, in the Basque country, in Bilbao, in Valencia, and in the country capital, Madrid, as well as in the Balearic Islands, in Mallorca. Spain's main industry is the tourist industry, um, which has had an Im incredibly important role in the development of Spain over the past 40 years. Um, I, I'm not sure if you know much about Spanish history, but as you probably know, history is very important and history has a very long arm. History is one of those things which influences a country and everything that a country does and all a country's systems. So I'll start off by telling you that Spain um, has discovered democracy only in 1975, previous to which to most of you may seem a very long time ago. But uh, I can assure you that um, it's nothing in political terms. Previous to, to democracy in Spain, there was a dictatorial regime, um, which Spain has spent the last 40 years trying to forget. Um, so that's, that's an important thing to remember. I won't go further back than that, but uh, I think it's good to remember that Spain is a relatively new democracy. Um, let me explain a little bit. Having um, spoken and made some, some Indian friends over two days, I particularly enjoyed the new friends that I met last night from the English and Foreign Language University. Um, I, I've learned a lot about India, and I think there are some similarities. Um, one of them is what we call in Spain devolution. All, education, all educational institutions are autonomous. They belong to the autonomous communities in, in Spain of which there are 17. So there is an overreaching ministry, but most decisions are taken on a very local level. And within that, universities are autonomous organisms, so they take their own decisions. So we often find a situation in which work is being duplicated and replicated across universities, where it might make sense to have, some, to have more cohesion. Um, so here we have the different regions. I'll go back to the previous map to tell you about the linguistic compos composition of Spain. Uh, it's basically a monolingual culture in which everyone speaks Spanish or Castellano, which originates from the center of Spain. As you can see, Castilla is right in the middle there. Um, there are, however, local languages and these local languages are extremely political. Language is almost always political. 
Um, and in the case of Spain, and the case of Spain is no less. So we have Catalonia, which is up on the right there, where they speak Catalan. We have Valencia, which is underneath Catalonia, where they speak Valencia. But Catalan and Valencia are the same language, differentiated only by the name. So if you are a Valencian person, uh, if you are a Valencian person and live in this region, your language is Valencia. If you are a Catalan person and live in this region, your language is Catalan, but they are actually both the same or extremely similar. I do hope there is no Valenciano or any Catalan in the audience. Um, I dare say they would not agree with me. There is another language. There are other languages as well. We have the Basque country up in the north there, in which Basque is spoken, which is a language which is not related in linguistic terms to any, any of the others. And then we have Gallego, which is just an, a, a region just above Portugal. So basically, we're talking about a monolingual country with politicized minor languages. Um, Spanish is spoken by everyone, and most people, the vast majority of Spanish inhabitants, do not speak any other language. What's the role of English in all this? English is a gatekeeper in Spain. I believe this is the case in India, too. Uh, parents who have been brought up um, with a, a comparatively old-fashioned methodology of language teaching and not just language teaching, of, other t uh, of teaching of other subjects as well, do not speak English. So the younger generation find themselves catapulted into a long career of English language learning. And their parents spend quite a lot of money on ensuring that their children can speak English. It is very important to them, and it's very important to the children. The Bologna process is, as you can see, um, a series of reforms which, um, which is in existence and is being implemented across Europe. The idea of the Bologna process and the idea behind the, the reforms is that Europe should become a common space where students can travel from one country to another with, and have their degrees validated without having to go through a long, complicated process of validation. Uh, here, it's um, defined as the most important uh, reform of higher education since 1968. So the idea is that staff and students can move around and make Europe a continent, make Europe a space in which to compete in, in this globalized world. Now, here we have the Common European Framework, which has its origin, obviously, in, in, in Europe. I, I don't know how familiar you are with this structure. The Common European Framework describes what learners can do and what learners can inspire to can aspire to do as they go through the levels my colleague and friend louisa dunn will be giving a presentation um a detail more much more detailed presentation than mine on the common Euro european framework which i'm sure you'll you'll enjoy um here we have basic una user independent user and proficient user a b and c as you can see um the people who designed the Common European Framework did not spend much time on uh, thinking of imaginative and interesting terminology. A, B, and C is, um, is what they use. But I think if you're familiar with, um, with the Alte descriptions, which are underneath, which are breakthrough, I keep losing my little spot here. Breakthrough, way stage, threshold, vantage, effective operational proficiency, and mastery. So we have this idea that in spite of the fact that we contemplate, with the Common European fr Framework, we contemplate languages as being uh, a, an ability to communicate in a language, either written or spoken or, or whichever skill we're using. Um, for 
that in Spain there's been a huge increase of mobility um, with the Erasmus program. And Spain is a very popular country because it's a tourist country. It's very popular with visitors and very popular with young people. And also young Spanish people are very keen to travel and they're very keen to see the world outside be and beyond their frontiers. Um, as you can see, Spain has 10 of the 20 most productive outgoing universities and 12 of the most popular incoming universities. It's a good country for young people. people young people tend to enjoy life very much in Spain. And with the Bologna process are new study plans which require a level of English. So as you can see, uh, to acquire a B1 or B2, which is um, an intermediate level, uh, is important in the Spanish scenario. I'd like you to just have a look at the difference. This, uh, these terms are taken, these words are taken from one of the descriptors from B1 and B2, which is, if I go back, you'll see that they are both independent users. If you have a look, can you have a look at the vocabulary there and see how different the vocabulary is? We have uh, in, the pu in purple, we have B2, complex, abstract, specialization, fluency, spontaneity, explain, detailed. Whereas in B1, we have standard, familiar, deal with, situation, simple, personal, and briefly describe. So in the space of one level, in the space of one level between B1 and B2, you'll see that there is a Quant a, a qualitative leap from independence to autonomy. Here you'll see it expressed in a slightly different way, but um, uh, do you, I, I, all of you are language learners. Do you, can you see the ladder here? You know, this feeling that you're going up the ladder and you're, you're going, you're not quite sure where you're going or how you're going to get there. Um, language learning is often expressed as a ladder, but very often it doesn't feel like a ladder, I feel. You feel, you, some, you have moments, I think, when you're learning a language, when you feel that you are progressing a lot. You have moments when you think you will never progress anymore, ever again. Well, this is the feeling I've had when I've been learning languages. In fact, it's a little, I think this is a, an image that's used by Krashen, the, uh, the garden. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, you sometimes think, how did that happen? I, I understand something or, or how is it that I don't understand this? And how is it I'm not able to do the other? And it's fairly unpredictable. You know how it should be. You know when the flowers should come out, but you can't exactly be very sure when they are going to come out. So I always see language learning as a mysterious pro, um, pr process. Threshold, we're looking at B, B1 now. You, you maintain interaction and you get across what you want to. You cope with problems of everyday life. For me, B1 is a little bit like this. You're struggling to express something, uh, perhaps in a, in a more abstract way than you are able. And the feeling is that you are, you are climbing and you are struggling. However, when you get a little bit higher up, when you get to Vantage, you feel as if you've got somewhere. There's a focus on effective argument. If you have a little look there, you can see a description of what Vantage should be. You become autonomous. You're able to function. You're able to more or less do what you need to do in the language. And you're able to more or less understand what is being said or what is being written. You've lost the feeling of disorientation, which is often what happens at B1. Maybe you feel a little bit, bit like this. You feel that you can smile, you feel that you can look out, and you feel that what is in front of you, you're able to cope with. What level do you need to study in? What level do you need to teach in? What skills do you need and why do you need them? I'm going to talk to you about a very specific situation in a group of students at the University of Alcalá de Henares. Um, they were a wonderful group of students. They were teaching and research staff from the University of Alcalá de Henares. And there were 50 of them, 50 plus. We level tested them. As I say, they were scientists. They used English regularly. 
and they filled in a questionnaire and a needs analysis form for us. Um, these were uh, well-established academics who had years of experience in, 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 in teaching their subject, often 20, 25 years of experience, and they were going to become students again. Why? In order to be able to deliver their courses in English, because in Spain, the population is not sustaining itself. It's going down. So Spanish universities w like and wish to welcome uni uh, university students from the outside in order to be able to fill up their places and keep their institutions going. Um, these students had been studying English for 15 plus years. And as you can see, with irregular results, some of them were actually even A1. Um, they went from A1 to C2. They were concerned about their ability to speak. They were concerned about their ability to communicate with the right register. They worried about presenting. They were concerned about answering questions at conferences. And they were, they were worried about being able to understand and most of the speaking levels were comparatively very low, clustering at B1. This is more or less how it broke, how it bro how the groups, how the group broke down. And I'm going to concentrate on this, on this top group here, the 12 that had a general level of C1 and C2, but as you can see, had a very low, comparatively very low level of speaking. They had high, fantastically high receptive skills, especially reading because they read journals and they read articles in, in English, but much lower level productive skills, although their writing was markedly higher than their speaking, their speaking was a real problem. Let's have a look at uh, the different m ways in which we can use speaking. We can use overall oral production, sustained monologue, which is what I'm doing now, um, sustained monologue, putting a case which would be arguing, something debating, something putting a, across a point of view, and then public announcements. But the one that interested us the most was addressing audiences, because this is what we as teachers do. We spend our lives addressing audiences. Maybe they're little audiences in terms of age, and maybe they're uh, adults, but we spend our lives addressing audiences. Have a look quickly at the difference between B1 and C1. C1 is where we wanted them to be in terms of their speaking, but B1 was where they were. Look at the difference between complex in C1, at some length in C1, subsidiary points spontaneously and effortlessly. Now that sounds like a description of a very proficient level. However, look at how they were, B1. Familiar, without difficulty, reasonable precision, may have to ask for repetition. As you can see, there seems to be an enormous gap between where they were and where we wanted them to be, and more importantly, where they needed to be. What could we do about it? Well, we started teaching them in a regular way, addressing all the skills with textbooks. But after the first semester, we decided to forget all our ideas about how to teach a group of this nature. We got rid of all the books. These students had more vocabulary than the teachers. Their grammar was excellent. Their ability was excellent. Their motivation was excellent. But they needed to concentrate very, very specifically on the skill of speaking. Have a look at learner skills. To be a good learner is a very important thing, and it involves a lot of different types of skills. The first one, declarative knowledge, what you know. That's a simple one to understand, I think. Skills and know-how, how to deal with a situation, how to deal with stress, how to deal with learning, how to deal with a difficult subject, how to deal with yourself when you're trying to contemplate a difficult issue in your, in your learning. And then your existential comp competence, how you exist in the world, how you see yourself in the world, how you see yourself in the classroom. And this group saw themselves as being rather important people, and they were important people, we're all important, but they were actually famous people and, and well-known people in their own field. So, and they were suddenly reduced to being 
students with difficulties. So they had to think about a lot of things, and we had to be very careful with them. Uh, and then the ability to learn, which is the autonomy of the learner, the things that we know work for us. They had to learn about that. They had come from a very traditional way of learning and teaching, which was the teacher talks, the student listens. The teacher knows, the student picks things up. The teacher takes the knowledge out of his or her head and places it into the student. And the student just has to listen and everything will be all right. These students of ours were going to have to change the, their way of thinking radically in order to be able to progress. So, going back a little bit, generally comparatively low level of speaking, they refused to speak in front of the class. We, in fact, had a professor of Latin amongst the scientists who told us that he was a professor of Latin and therefore he did not speak because with Latin, you don't need to speak. And he thought he could transfer that idea across to English. Uh, it took us a while to convince him that actually he needed to learn to speak. He did, actually. He did. He found it very difficult, though, and it took him a long time. Um, a, a difficulty uh, pronouncing uh, non-Spanish words, and, and very often these were key words, the usual difficult English sound of uh and uh, produced p particular difficulty than i and e again, a lot of difficulty. And then the fact, another problem was the fact that as a collective, as a group, they had normalized versions of key sounds. So uh, a, a professor of architecture would refer to their subject as arquitecture, which meant that another Spanish person could understand, but a person in an international congress could not understand. And that was a key word. Um, and then words like, again, we, we go back to the typically difficult sounds. A word like scientific would, would be misinterpreted at an international conference. So there were key words that were being consistently mispronounced. The confidence was low. Here we have the effective filters, which I think we often underestimate the importance of. You know, how do you feel about l learning something? How, how does it make you feel, the fact that you have difficulty? So the general confidence was low, and their fear of speaking was high. Fear of mistakes, fear of feeling foolish, had a great effect on their motivation. Their resistance, conscious and subconscious, uh, to production of what they considered to be new sounds. Here I'm asking you a little question which is what effective filters are active in your situation? How about your students? How do your students feel about certain aspects of their learning and certain areas of their learning? What, what difficulties are, do, uh, do they have in attitude? Uh, I, I think someone very clever said attitude is everything, and, and I think you, you probably agree with me in the teaching and learning situation. Attitude is everything. Um, you, a student can always learn. Some students can learn a lot in a short time, and some students can learn a lot in a long time, but everyone can learn. But nobody will learn if they think they can't, which was what was going on with our students. They actually thought that they were going to be incapable of speaking, especially the Latin professor who thought languages were just for reading and not for speaking at all. However, on the good side, we had successful and motivated academics. We had people who felt good about themselves and who were good in their discipline. Professional interest, general high, high level of language control in English and obviously in their own language. They were hard workers. They were good at homework. And they were interested in the way we taught. This was a, a, a wonderful experience for us because they were very interested in how we delivered the learning to them and how audacious we were and the methods that we used to get them to speak. Action. Autonomy is, essential, is essentially the match of the learner's psychological reaction to the process and content of learning. So what we decided to do was use exclusively an academic discourse which we knew that uh, no teacher can do without, and that is the presentation. 
Um, it's central to classroom activity. However much a teacher tries to devolve the action, and it, it, especially the language teacher, especially uh, when we are trying to encourage communication, uh, we make much of the interaction that goes on between students. And although I believe this occurs in many other academic disciplines, perhaps it doesn't occur quite as much. Um, so presentations we felt would motivate our students highly. Um, they were personally and professionally connected with their subject. So that was a big plus for us. And they were great friends. They were great friends. They were a fantastic group because they were all in the same boat together. They all felt silly about speaking. They all knew each other. They'd known each other for years. They'd all been using English. Some of them actually confessed to having taken young students along with them to international conferences so that the young students could actually do the presentations for them while they waited on the sidelines. Such was their lack of confidence in, in their in their oral expression. So we use this group dynamic and this trust to our advantage, I think, and we got them to work a lot together. Students who didn't wish to speak, we didn't make them speak. We started off very softly, very softly. Um, the distance between actual development level as determined by independent problem solving and the level of potential development is determined through problem solving. Okay, this is a Vygotskyan idea. Um, and we used it. We used the zone of proximal de development by enabling the less able, able members of the class to be assisted and scaffolded and supported by the more able members of the class. So a couple would, for example, give a presentation together. They did presentations on all kinds of subjects like bird watching, cooking, all kinds of things um, which they, which also meant that the classes were entertaining. We found out a lot about their hobbies and about their habits and about their lives whilst they were learning how to, how to use English in, in for, for their presentations. Um, this helped them as well learn how they learned. Learn, it helped them to learn what worked for them. And little by little, in our attempt to get them from B1 and B2, which is, on, you can see on the left, to C1, this constant scaffolding, constant support, but consistency and constancy in our approach, we felt was going to inevitably lead to success. Now, the big question here was, were we sure? And of course, we weren't. We were worried and concerned that um, our solution wouldn't work. And can you imagine if our solution didn't have much of an effect, how demotivated those students were going to be for the rest of their lives? We were aiming at them internalizing, taking, pos taking possession of the knowledge, feeling that they can actually use that language, they can get inside that language, they can control that language. You know that very good feeling you have when you start functioning on your own in another language and you just can't wait to speak it and you love talking, you love practicing. We wanted to get them there. We wanted to get them excited about their ability to speak. We were, and, and, you know, to get them out of, out of the problem they felt they were in, into a situation in which they were confident and happy and absolutely looking forward to their next opportunity to go to an international conference was was where we really needed them to go. So we kept our fingers crossed and just kept going. And when they needed support, we just kept giving it to them. And we got them to practice and practice and practice and practice. And we focused on the following. Um, intense and active error correction. Error correction is one of those things that we know. Well, I think I, I, from observation of colleagues, you know, <sighs> It's hard to know when to use it. It's hard to know when not to use it. Some students react fantastically well to error correction. Other students react well but never correct the error. Other students um, react badly and correct the error. And other students react badly and don't correct the error. Error correction is one of those things which I think we'll be talking about in 2,000 years' time, how to get people to 
do it right, how to get them to say architecture instead of architecture, because you can only you can only correct them actively a certain number of times. So to get to this internalization, this mysterious internalization, which some people seem to be able to achieve more easily than others, took a lot of work and a lot of discussion amongst the teachers and a lot of discussion amongst our students. Intense and active error correction, the introduction of phonetic symbols which we felt would help them. They hated phonetic symbols at the beginning. They absolutely hated them. But we kept going with phonetic symbols. We kept on pointing, getting them to bring examples, getting them to cut things out as if they were kids at school, getting them to stick them up on the board, to make a little book with the words in, all that kind of thing. And you know, we thought they wouldn't like that, but they actually found that quite fun. They'd come in and show you their little notebook with their latest contributions in terms of phonetic symbols. So that, that worked nicely. And also it gave them a rest. You know, whilst they were cutting out and making lists, they were relaxing a little bit from the very intensive instruction we were giving them. Whoops. Um, pronunciation and intonation. Drill, drill, drill. Uh, the, do you remember drilling? Drilling and again and again and again and again and again. You know, some people actually built methodologies around drilling. You probably have heard of methodologies that are, are, are based on drilling. A, a methodology that's based on drilling is crazy. But drilling does have its role, just like memory and rote learning. Memory and rote learning also have their function. And the studying of grammar, intense grammar study also have their function. So we did a lot of drilling. And you know, we had fun doing the drilling. And the students had fun doing the drilling. They kind of enjoyed laughing at each other. And they got used to being laughed at, something which, in principle, they hated. But then they actually got to enjoy it. Um, Use of the University of Alcalá de Henares, the university intranet and YouTube, they get on the university intranet, and, which is a kind of a very primitive version of Skype, and they talk to each other, and they give presentations to each other, and they'd have fun. They'd have fun. Here we have the horrible phonemic chart we gave them, which they hated, but they learned to love. Our results. General increase in learner autonomy. There was absolutely no doubt whatsoever about that. And a heightened awareness of their own speaking issues. They became aware of what words they were, they were unhappy about pronouncing. They became aware of what situations made them feel particularly nervous. Um, they increased in confidence across all skills, which was what we were aiming at. Maybe even some of them were not getting that much better but they got a lot better at producing that B1 level with more fluency. And we felt that, that, that even that was enough because, because that was getting them going along, along the right path. There was a marked improvement in their level of speaking, but there was one thing that we got a bit upset about. And that was, it, that I, <laughs> Two or three of them, especially two of them, stick in my mind as actually having progressed far less than we would have liked. But it made us rethink the whole structure of our courses, not only for university lecturers, but also for the students, because we also taught large groups of university students. So what we did with our university students was, I'll tell you the profile we'd get. In one semester, we would get 60 A2s. We got rid of their book. They were, they were addicted to the book, utterly addicted to the book, and would have panic. They would feel panic if we made them close the book. We got those books closed, and we got them talking. And that, uh, we were particularly successful in, in, uh, in the semester, in six months, from getting them from A2 very often up to B2 and actually able to speak. So, so we learned that. However, I go back to my two or three that manifested a resistance at some point. You know, hated feeling the way they felt about their ability and were generally speaking unhappy. But towards the end of the, they, 
towards the end of the first year, they were beginning to relax and they signed up again for the next year. So even though we experienced some degree of failure, what we did learn was the value of getting students to speak right from the beginning. Not wait until they could, not wait until they had some idea, not wait until they knew something, no. Right from the beginning, get the students to speak. So we've placed a much more emphasis on our programs in, uh, for speaking now. Um, sometimes we sit around in, there are countries in Europe, one of them is Italy, one of them is Spain, uh, one of them is Greece, in which for some reason, students are particularly bad at the speaking skill. And we often wonder why this is, you know, it's the system. Well, why is the system the way it is? Why do they not speak in class? There must be a reason, because nothing happens for no reason. How is it that in other countries, students are much more willing, happy, and proud to show they can speak? And it's a mystery to us. People have different opinions on this, and one of them is that the students were often when as primary school children, they often had to know the lesson off by heart. And if they didn't know the lesson, um, then they got it wrong. You know, you don't know it, you've got it wrong. Come out to the blackboard, no, that's wrong. Um, and the general stay, status of public discourse in Spain is actually one which requires some attention. Um, when politicians debate on the television, they end up yelling at each other, and you actually think they're going to break out into a fight. Um, it seems that by conceding points to the other, then it seems that you are, um, you're losing your argument. It's a very delicate sort of, sort of situation, and children are not encouraged to, to speak um, logically, coherently, and respectfully to the other in schools. And we think this probably reflects throughout society. However, I digress. Um, some students manifested resistance, and but that's another story. This is a work in progress, certainly in Spain, and certainly amongst older learners. So thank you very much for your attention, and... That's my presentation finished. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them if I can. I'm representing a country uh, like the same country you came from, like Spain, monolingual country, where English is used for instrumental purposes. But I wonder, what types of teacher training program do you have there? Can you shed light on type of teacher training program? Mm -hmm. Teacher training in Spain has changed radically over the past 10 years, and teaching methodology has changed radically in schools. So in primary schools and in secondary schools, the, the old system of the teacher knows, the student doesn't, the teacher will tell you um, how to learn, is definitely going out. It hasn't gone out. But importantly, in universities, it's only just beginning to go out with the Bologna process. So people are changing their attitudes towards teaching. Um, but like all these things, it's not happening qu quickly enough, but it is happening. And I'm utterly convinced that with the Bologna process, it will happen. People are changing their minds. Um, and and it, it's, it's important to remember that because you know, like we has been referred to in, in a couple of the presentations I've seen, that ability to change your lifelong way of learning to do, of teaching, uh, is a very tall order for teachers because teachers have spent their whole lives doing it one way. And they think that that's obviously, they think that's the best way to do it. That's why they do it like that. And, you know, their attitude towards new, more communicative methods, more, more of a two-way process can be, can be uh, counterproductive to entering into this n new way of, of, of engaging with the students. So it's, it's an issue, it's an issue. But hopefully it's an issue which is beginning to be resolved. And at university we have to keep our fingers crossed and keep going for it to, to actually change as much as it needs to. Good morning. Uh, I'm Raghuram, uh, English Training Center here in AP. 
the same problems are similar to us, uh, particularly with the pronunciation and uh, certain consonants. And what I observed in Spanish English is that they don't realize the clear L and dark L in particular and certain vowel sounds. So in the same case in our training programs also, uh, we have paid more attention to pronunciation by showing the phonemic chart and etc. Cetera, et cetera. So as, soon as, the tr uh, as long as the training continues, it's okay. But when the training is over, they go back to their own pronunciation. As a result, I made an experiment with the students. And this time, I didn't teach phonemic chart. Rather, I presented some short dialogues and sentences as they are. And I experimented with the, this system for one or two months. Uh, ultimately, what I observed is their pronunciation is really tremendous, particularly with the students. This I did instead of introducing uh, discrete elements with the help of a phonemic chart. And I tried with the, uh, the larger extent, or uh, I can say, di discourses, speeches and conversations. They, they, they were able to pick up language, uh, not in, in a different, distinguished manner. This really worked well, madam. Yes, I'm sure it did work well. Uh, and that does work well. The, the thing about pronunciation, I don't know if you find this to be the case, but it, it, as long as the person you, you want to converse with can understand you, it, that tends to be okay, that tends to be enough. And so if you have a group, as we did, of academics who understood each other perfectly well with their str strange, if you'll forgive the expression, with their normalized, particular, personalized version of, of pronunciation, then, then it's not an issue. But the problem was when they had to go outside of that comfort zone and communicate with other, with, uh, with other people. Um, we often find, having worked with teenagers, we find that teenagers are great at pronunciation. They can pronounce words in the way in which they're instructed to do so. They can imitate, you know, they understand um, how to form the sounds and they can form them. But as soon as they have, as soon as they have uh, the opportunity almost, between themselves they'll go back to the silly pronunciation, which they seem to like so much. It's a very uh, personal, and very, um, it's to do with your relations with your immediate group as well. You don't want to stand out by having good pronunciation. So what do you do? You make it bad. Um, you want to fit in. So you don't want to stand out as being the goody goody who says, who says, who says it correctly. So you, you reduce your, your standards and, and use the pronunciation that, that, it, that is used with your peer group. So, and the pronunciation and language, as we know, is all about identity. You know, we have to defend our identity in the group. So we have a lot of things to deal with when we're dealing with pronunciation. A lot of things to deal with. And I can imagine in India that must be very important to keep in mind that, you know, you speak to your group or you speak to this group or you speak to that group. My own pronunciation, when I go back to my town in, in, in England, I talk like everyone else does there, but as soon as I'm out, you know, I speak this sort of standard English which was drummed into us at school. It's to do with who we are, where we are, and what we're saying, and who we're saying it to. That makes it difficult. Ma'am, I'm Poonam Bharadwaj from Kendri Vidyalaya Sangathan. Ma'am, you just now told that attitude is very important in language learning. So how can we encourage the students to change the attitude to learn English language, when not only they are official language, rather they are more inclined to speak dialects. And this dialectical pronunciation and this learning behavior creates a hindrance in English language learning. Okay, yes. Um, I think the principle of what you're saying, you can apply to practically any situation. How do we get them to change the attitude? How do we get them to be in a place that we want them to be? We have to make it look attractive to them, and that is a tall order. I think any influence of any sound, of any dialect or any language is equally, um, equally impacts on the, on the pronunciation that you're looking for. So I actually think probably the difference between someone coming from one language and someone coming from one dialect is, is not the important thing. The important thing I, I believe, is to try and get those students into a place where they actually want to go there. They want to go there or they need to go there. What else can we do? Expose them to it, believe in it, 
show them how nice it is, let them listen to the music, you know, that kind of thing. Make it as personal as possible to them, make it as relevant as possible to their context. And in terms of attitude, I think that's all we can do. Does that sound a little pessimistic? This is Sridhar. What is the uh, medium of instruction in Spanish universities? And is it compulsory for foreigner uh, uh, to learn Spanish? And what are the other courses uh, apart from teacher educators in Spanish universities? And what are the opportunities for Indians to study there? I can answer nearly all of your questions, but I can't answer the last one. But if we get in touch after the, after the presentation, I will I'll get the information for you. Spanish universities are fantastic. Spanish society it, it revolves around young people. Young people are kings and queens in their homes. They're kings and queens in their street. They have everything at their fingertips. The universities are, generally speaking, very solid, and they offer everything. Yes, there is a language requirement, but Spanish is a gatekeeper uh, also. Spanish is a gatekeeper in, in, within uh, South America and within, which doesn't particularly concern us here, but, but Spanish it is required. You'd be required in order to get on a degree course in Spain, you'd be required to get to manifest to uh, certify B1. Now, how strict they would be about that certification um, is uh, fortunately for a lot of students who go, not particularly strict. So, but it's around about B1, B2, and the certification will be is 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 fairly flexible. Um, but if you like, we can talk afterwards, and we'll we'll exchange details, and I'll find out about the specific um, situation in terms of Indian applicants. I, I think we finished there. That's right, isn't it? So thank you very much indeed for coming, and thank you for your interest. And. Um, Please come and see me afterwards and I'll give you my contact details. Thank you.